On July 20th, 1969, a worldwide and monumental achievement happened. July 20th, 1969, what was it? The moonwalk. We landed a ship and astronauts for the very first time on the moon. So all of us probably know that. Most of us know. Now we all know. But probably most of us know the first man to walk the moon. What was his name? Neil Armstrong. Maybe less of us know the name of the second man to walk the moon. A few more of you do. My wife does because I came home. I was so excited to share this with her. And she's like, no, I know. We've been doing this with the kids through school. And she beat me to it. But Buzz Aldrin was the second man to walk the moon. Does anybody know how Buzz celebrated and commemorated that mon monumentous occasion? Some of you know. Buzz pulled out a small self-serve communion cup. With the authority and the permission of his Presbyterian denomination, he administered and partook in the holy sacrament of communion. Later, Buzz wrote these words about his experience and from his viewpoint. He says, I poured the wine into the chalice our church had given me. And the one-sixth gravity of the moon, the wine curled slowly and gracefully up the sides of the cup. It was interesting to think that the very first liquid ever poured on the moon and the first food eaten there were the communion elements. Hey, in preparing for small groups, which launched this fall in September, we've taken three weeks, including today, three weeks looking at the topic of community. Week one, we looked at community as a menu, as a choice, that you have to choose biblical community, that it just will not organically and naturally happen. It is something that you must choose to do and be a part of. And also, when you choose something on a menu, it comes at a cost. You only have so much money, only so much time, almost so, only so much energy. And so when you choose to participate in community, it means when you say yes to that, you're saying no to something else. It means when you choose community, it means you might not choose, you not, might be saying no to sleeping in or going to bed early, TV time, free time, or me time, soccer practice on Wednesdays, drama club on Mondays, a clean house, pushing past the fears or social awkwardness of having people in your house. When you choose community, you have to say yes to that, you will have to say no to something else because we live incredibly, incredibly busy, jam-packed, full, digitally distracted lives. And so to make room for that, you have to say no to something else. And choice, community is a choice. It's one, though, that I wonder, are you willing to live without? Are you willing to live without the benefits that come with biblical community? And fall short of that abundant and full life that Jesus speaks about. Last week we talked about the table in our, our series, Menu, Cup, and Table. We talked about the ministry of hospitality. We talked about how the table can be a force of evangelism and refuge. Allowing people far from God to belong before they become. Before they become the person that God's destined them or called them to be. It's a place of invitation that they're allowed to walk into relationship before maybe they even give their lives to God. This week, we're looking at the cup in our third and final installment of the series. And we're looking at communion. There's a lot of different ways you can approach communion. A few, uh, maybe two months ago, I actually had Steve Spickerman come up and share a personal testimony completely different from what we're going to be talking about just all these things that communion can do and does do in your life. But today we're going to be looking at the cup, the communion, the bread, and the drink that Jesus modeled for us in specifically how it relates to community. So today in menu, cup, and table, we're looking at the cup and how it draws us and pulls us into deeper biblical community. I have three points for you today if you're taking notes. And the very first one is this, is the communion reminds us of our invitation to community with God. Communion reminds us of our invitation to community with God. Communion was originated, was modeled and given to the church 
by Jesus Christ himself. If you follow with me in Matthew 26, and I'm sorry, today we're not going to be studying just one specific passage. We have a bunch of different places, Old and New Testament, we're going to be drawing through. So if you're good with your thumbs, you can flip there really quick with your fingers. Or if you know your Bible well, you can follow me. But we're going to go fast. Everybody say fast. Everybody say slow down. Have you been listening to any of the sermons? Slow down. Okay, Matthew 26, 26 through 29. It says this, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he blessed it. Then he broke it into pieces and gave it to his disciples saying, take this and eat it for this is my body. He took a cup of wine and he gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it for this is my blood which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. This is a reminder, if you remember from just a, a couple of weeks ago in our series on Abraham, we talked about the new covenant that God had come and made with Abraham and how it was fulfilled in and through Jesus Christ. And here Jesus is reaffirming, saying the covenant that Abraham, that God made with Abraham is being fulfilled through me. The first thing that communion does, number one, it reminds us of our invitation to community with God. I pulled out my systematic theology textbook this week, and Wayne Grudman, he says it this way. He says, the Lord's Supper is an ordinance that is to be observed repeatedly throughout our Christian lives as a sign of continuing in fellowship with Christ. When you take communion, when you process and go through communion, you should think about God's invitation or hospitality. It is a sign. It is a uh, symbolic sharing of a meal with God. You know, in our day and age right now, we, we take communion and it's these little morsels. Everybody say morsels. Thanks. You take these little these little bits, right? This little bit of bread and this little bit of juice and cup or whatever and you you take it, but the idea is that you are sharing a meal in the presence of God. In the Jewish history, and when the church just began, it wasn't just little morsels. It was actually the beginning of a full-on meal called the Lord's Supper. They would sit together and eat a full meal when they participated in communion. But this is so powerful because this reminds us that we have full and complete union with God now. Because of Jesus Christ. This didn't used to be this way. You know in the Old Testament there's only a few mentions of when God's people could eat a meal in God's presence. And they were always partial and not complete or lasting. They were situational or occasional. In Exodus 24, 9-11, through God has given his people the Ten Commandments. And he calls them to feast in his presence. In Deuteronomy 14, 23, and 26, when God is giving them laws on the tithe, he says, when you bring in the grain tithe and the wine tithe and all this food into my house, participate and feast in my presence. But again, these things were not lasting. They were partial and incomplete, leaning towards the future of what was to come. You know, about a week or two ago, Pastor Elliot, me and my wife celebrated eight years of marriage. I get the honor today and the anxiety today of preaching in front of Pastor Elliot today. He was Amy's pastor growing up, and he did our premarital counseling, also taught me how to paint. And I'm very, very appreciative to Pastor Elliot. But Pastor Elliot, when we went through uh, last week, when we were celebrating our anniversary, the kids were a little bit stuffy, overtired, and so we weren't able to get out on our, the actual day. But we ordered our favorite food, takeout, and once we got all the kids locked into their rooms and shut down for the night, we just sat around the table and we were just sharing memories and talking about things that, uh, favorite memories of marriage. Just times and experiences. And something Amy said has really just stuck out with me. And she said, one of my favorite things about getting married to you was that good night no longer meant goodbye. 
You see, when we were dating, uh, we were together in college, but when we got engaged, we had actually uh, started dating uh, long distance. I went to Indiana, and she stayed here and up here in Illinois area. And so we were dating long distance, and so that meant that either our phone calls or our text messages, when we said goodnight, we would go to our separate beds and separate homes. Even if we came and saw each other, and when the sun went down and the date was over, it meant that goodnight meant we would go to our separate beds and separate places. Goodnight meant goodbye. It was a partial and incomplete full union. But when we got married on August 3rd, 2014, good night for the first time no longer meant goodbye. Because we shared a bed, we shared a home, we shared a life together now. And so communion is a reminder that God's presence with God, community with God is no longer partial, no longer incomplete. That you have somebody in heaven advocating for you. Setting the table, creating a spot for you at the table, at God's hospitality, at his table. We come and dine in God's presence. And it's no longer partial, no longer incomplete, but it's everlasting and full. That we can enjoy God's presence in his full presence in community with God through Jesus Christ. Wayne Goodman, again, he says it this way. He says, we meet him, speaking of Jesus, we meet him at his table to which he comes to give himself to us. As we receive the elements of bread and wine and the presence of Christ, so we partake of him and all his benefits. We feed upon him in our hearts with thanksgiving. Communion is a consistent reminder of the hospitality of God, that he invites us to the table again and again without restriction or obstruction, and that through Jesus we have full access to the Father. King David in Psalms, he says it this way, Psalms 27, 4 and 8. He says, the one thing I ask of the Lord, the thing I seek most, is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in his temple. My heart has heard you say, come and talk with me. And my heart responds, Lord, I am coming. Paul in Romans eleven seventeen, he says it this way. Some of these branches from Abraham's tree some of the people of Israel have been broken off, but you Gentiles, and that's all of us in this room, you were branches from a wild olive tree, but you've been grafted in. So now you also receive the blessings God has promised Abraham and his children, sharing in rich nourishment from the root of God's special olive tree. In John 14, Jesus says, I'm leaving you to go create room in my father's house. All of these things show the Father's heart, that his desire is to welcome you. His desire is to have many rooms, enough room for everybody in this house, enough rooms for any person that would receive and accept the invitation and say, yes, I'm coming. He has room for you in his house. He has room for you at the table. He has room for you in his heart. He has room and relational depth to give towards you. He's never too busy to sit with you. He's never too busy not to show up when you show up. If you draw close to him, the scripture says, he will draw close to you. Communion, number one. Firstly, it reminds us of the community, of the invitation to community with God. And number two, communion centers the capital C church in unity. You know, every year our church does it corporately. We do something called Church on the Round. On the Good Friday service or service of shadows that we call it, we rearrange this whole sanctuary. We put everything in a big circle and we put a cross in the middle. Every time the youth group goes to summer camp or a retreat or has a big outing and they have come back and they do testimonies, they do Church on the Round where they set up the circle of chairs and they put a cross in the middle. And it's very important why we do that. The reason that we do that is as a physical reminder that the church is not about anything less than Jesus Christ. It's so easy to sometimes look at a church or your faith establishment and, and get sucked up into things. Well, my church does it this way. We, we wear clothes this way or we talk this way or, or we, we preach this way or we believe this way. We're the charismatic or we're the, uh, we, we, we know our Bible well. We, we're emotional. We're well-grounded, whatever it is. We know how to worship, whatever. It's so easy to get locked in those things and say, this is how it should be done. But you know, the church is one of those places that is the most diverse group that I can think of. 
rich and old, young, rich and poor, young and old, every ethnicity, every language. It goes beyond into all parts of the world, drawing people together that would not normally be drawn together under the same umbrella and the same message of Jesus Christ. When we circle the chairs and we put a cross in the middle, it's a physical representation of how we approach the world. Approach the world. When you're sitting there and you look across the way and you catch Jim Quirk's eyes and you lock in and you give a little wink and you try to make him laugh during service, you are looking at him and between you, you are physically separated by the cross. Meaning that every time you come to a person, you look at them through the lens of Jesus Christ. Every time you approach somebody, you look at them at the lens of Jesus Christ. It's not about a speaker or a preacher or a band leader or the songs we say or the way we do it. All of those things are variations and all of those things center on the same truth. One way, Jesus Christ. There's theological differences. There's different denominations because of that. But all of those things I praise God for because it's a variation you know, a few, I don't know, I think this was two, three years ago, we did a chili cook-off in this room, and we brought hay for the first and last time ever into this church. Bad mistake. <laughs> but we had 14, 15 different chilies on the back table back there, and everybody's taking and testing and stuff, and there was, there was an order to it. There was a first and a second and a third place, but what it showed is that some people liked different chilies more than others. I like number 14, I like number 15. I like this church, I like this ministry, I like how this guy preaches, I like how that ministry goes, I like this hymn, I like this song. But all of those things are okay as long as you don't find your identity in those things. All church, capital C, we are unified in the same message of Jesus Christ. And everything else is just the flavor. I'm thankful we have different variations like that because it reaches more people. It reaches people that say, I can't, for whatever reason, I, I don't, I just can't feel God quite like that. But when you do it this way, I just am brought right into his presence. Great blessing. Go there and enjoy that. But every church, or hundreds of churches around the U.S. right now, around the world, are taking communion today. Thousands of churches every year, every month are taking communion and with the same message is being proclaimed. We believe in the blood and the body that was given from my soul to draw me into relationship to Jesus Christ. When you take communion, it brings unity, not just with the people around you, not just in the church, but capital C, worldwide, the body of Christ. It reminds us all that we can be diverse, but we can be unified. It reminds us all that we can have a different mission statement, a different vision statement, but we all have the same cross on our building. It reminds us all that we serve the same God. A few months ago, I was, uh, I think I told you the story already, but I picked up a car for my sister off of Facebook. And so when I went to pick it up, I took Pastor Joe with me. And so I went there, and we both looked at the car. It was great. And so I went into the bank to get the money. And on the way out, the woman confronted me. She said, Josh, you've been holding out on me. I didn't know you were a Christian. And this woman's Indian, strong dialect, came here as an immigrant, works in a different place, different, uh, different part of the town, different church, different language. But we were unified in that moment because we called the same God, God. You see what I'm saying here is that the cup brings us into unity even if we do it different. Even if we approach God differently. When you take communion, you are joining in the holy sacrament given by Jesus to the church for every person to participate in and come to the table. If you call Jesus Christ Lord and Savior, you are welcome to the table. If you call Jesus Christ Lord and Savior, then you are brother or sister. If you call Jesus Christ Lord and Savior, then you are unified in the same vision, same mission, same master. Even if the, all the other things can be a little different. 1 Corinthians 3, 4 through 5, Paul says it this way. He says, when one of you says, I'm a follower of Paul, and another says, I'm a follower of Apollos, aren't you acting just like the people in the world? After all, who's Apollos? Who's Paul? We are only God's servants through whom you believe the good news. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. Colossians 1.18, Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body, 
He is the beginning, the supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. Communion reminds us of the invitation we have with God. It's a consistent, constant reminder. And two, communion centers the capital C church in unity. And lastly, communion allows us to know and to be known. Just doing a quick Google definition of what communion is and what communion is. This is the definitions we get. It's the sharing or exchange of an intimate thoughts, feelings, especially when the exchange is on a mental or spiritual level. To commune with somebody means to share one's intimate thoughts or feelings with that person, especially on a spiritual level, to feel close and spiritual contact with them. Corinthians 27 through 31, Paul's giving instructions to the church on how to approach communion. He says, anyone who eats this bread or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you're eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are weak, sick, and some have even died. But if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. Paul's giving us basically a four-step process when we take communion. We pause and examine ourselves. See if there's any sin, anything inhibiting us from coming into God's presence. God, a holy God, cannot stand evil and he will not be around it. And so, have you any sin that you need to confess before coming into his presence? Two, we take the bread. Three, we take the the cup. And then four, we give thanks to God. And so Paul's talking about this very first thing is make sure that your heart is right with God. Every time you come to communion, it is, again, the same feeling, the same time, the first time that you gave your heart to God. The first time when you said, God, I am a sinner. I cannot make my way to heaven through any action, any deed. I can't be a good enough person on my own to get into heaven. Will you come and take that all away from me? You pause and examine and say, is there anything separating me from God? Now, this is called confession. And there's a couple, Bible gives two ways. There's private confession but there's also corporate confession. James 5.16 says, Confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Communion can be a wonderful place of confession and reconciliation. It can be a place where you are known, where you become exposed, but you receive love and grace and are healed and made whole. Now, there's no rhyme, there's no legit, uh, uh, rigorous law when it comes to this. But when God places it on your heart, maybe it's private and it's okay. But there are times when it will benefit you to go to a brother or a sister that you trust and share the things that you've been trying to hide. The things that you say, I can deal with this on my own. This is my own privacy, my own private failure. Just Jesus needs to know. There are times... When you can go to somebody and you can share those things with them. And this is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer says about it. He says, sin demands to have a man by himself. It withdraws him from the community. The more isolated a person is, the more destructive will the power of sin over him. And the more deeply he becomes involved in it, the more disastrous is his isolation. Sin wants to remain unknown. It shuns the light. In the darkness of the unexpressed, it poisons the whole being of a person. Confession is not a law. It is an offer, a divine help for the sinner. You know, a large setting like this, we have a couple hundred people in a room. We take communion together. It can be difficult to find a place or an opening. It can be hard to actually orchestrate that where you come to a person and find that time of confession. But when a small group, a a few people that you've been building trust up with, that you've been in their homes and they've been in yours, and you've had that intimate interaction of eating food together, and you drop the taco on your shirt, and they're like, here's a napkin, and you've had that time to build trust, that is a wonderful opportunity to come and to know and to be known with your neighbor. 
That is a wonderful opportunity in trusting relationship to say, when you take communion as a small group, it would behoove your small group to do it frequently. As to spend an opportunity and say, does anybody partner up? Go, go in this room, this room, this room. Practice the corporate confession. Practice confessing to each other. Why? There's a couple reasons. And Dietrich, again, Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, our brother has been given to us to help us. He hears the confessions of our sins in Christ's stead. He forgives our sins in Christ's name. He keeps the secret of our confession as God keeps it. When I go to my brother to confess, I am going to God. Augustine of Hippo says that the confession of evil works is the first beginning of good works. Communion and community allows others to know us more deeply. When you go to somebody and you speak and you open up that intimate, vulnerable, scary place, the things that you don't even like to look at, let alone let other people look at, you give them an opportunity to manifest the presence of God and Jesus Christ in that moment. God has given us the ability he even says in scripture first john is that his god invisible god has expressed invisible love the actions of each other you are an agent of god's grace to that person you've been able to remind them of what god says about them you've been able and put in that moment to remind them of what how god treats our sin and so you remind them of the body that's been given, and you remind them of the blood that's been spilt, and you remind them of the sacrifice of Jesus and saying, it's covered. And when you do that, you can break through, in the words of Dietrich, you break through to certainty. Maybe you've sometimes felt that. You've had a, a sin or that addiction or that hidden thing that just nagging at you. You feel the guilt and you feel the shame and you try to hide it up in the worship and you try to not think about it and try to push it away, but it comes up again and again and it makes you say, am I really saved? Am I really changed? Am I really, am I really the person who I say I am? When you go and you go share it to a person, the power that sin has over you is broken because sin, when it's exposed to light, dissipates. In the presence of light, darkness cannot stand. And so when you go to a person and you trust them and you expose that part of you, the power that's been holding you breaks away in the certainty of Jesus Christ. The grace that's been extended to you invades your heart. And just a word of warning. Church, if you have somebody that comes to you and trusts you with that information, your job is to be the reflection of God the Father to them. If it's not abusive, it's not endangering them or other people, you treat that confession as God treats it. In Psalms, he says, he throws our sins as far as the east is to the west. He, he forgets our iniquities. All powerful, all knowing, all, all omnipresent, omnipotent, omni whatever God forgets our iniquities. And you, in that moment, administer grace and then you forget the iniquity. It's not gossip time. It's not information for you to hold on to. It's not your place to judge them. All you are is a mere or reflection of God's love to that person. Administer that. Be the best that you can reflection of love. And then the sin, that confession dissipates in that moment. Communion reminds us of our invitation to community with God. Communion centers the capital church in unity. And lastly, communion allows us to know and to be fully known in our community. Church, we're going to move into a, uh, practicing communion today. We're going to take communion as a church and end in worship. I just want to pause and just let this sink in for just a second, though, before we press on. So we're just going to go into a moment of prayer. And ushers, if you can just prepare yourselves. If you do not have a communion cup, if you call Jesus Lord and Savior, we practice open communion. Just raise your hand, and an altar, uh, a usher will come and get you a communion cup. I see one in the back row. If you one in the middle row over here, a couple on the sides. But if you just bow your heads, and we can just pray before we go into the communion. 
Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for this holy moment. Thank you, God, that we can come in in a chorus, raise our voice in praise. That in unity we can say amen and praise God. That as a community we can come and open up the Bible and, and learn together, Father, and seek to follow you together.